This is Speak Up. I am Sandra Schulte. Welcome back to our show. I am so pleased to have Evan Ellis with us, a tremendous authority on Latin American affairs. Dr. Ellis is a pro research professor of Latin American studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. His focus is on Latin America's relationships with China and with other non-Western actors, as well as organized crime and popularism in the region. Dr. Ellis has published over 400 works, including five books. They are China in Latin America, The What's and Wherefores, published in 2009, The Strategic Dimension of Chinese Engagement with Latin America, published in 2013, China on the Ground in Latin America, published in 2014, Transnational Organized Crime in Latin America and in the Caribbean, published in 2018, and China Engages Latin America, Distorting Development and Democracy, published in 2022. Dr. Ellis previously served on the Secretary of State's Policy Planning Staff with responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as being responsible for policy concerning international narcotics and law enforcement. In this capacity, Dr. Ellis presented his work in a broad range of business and government forums in 27 countries on four continents. He has given testimony on Latin American security issues to U.S. Congress on various occasions. He has discussed his work regarding China and other external actors in Latin America on a broad range of radio and television programs and is regularly cited in the print media in the United States and Latin America for his work in this area. Dr. Ellis has been awarded the Order of Military Merit, Jose Maria Cordova by the Colombian government for his scholarship on security issues in the region. Dr. Ellis, what is the People's Republic of China seeking in Latin America? That's a great question, and it's a real pleasure to be on the show. Uh, for me, and I followed this uh, for about 20 years now, um, although I believe that the China is principally looking to cement its own uh, economic interest, that does not make it any the less uh, impactful for the region or any the less uh, strategic in terms of, of the U.S. relationship with Latin America. But in general, I, I think uh, what China starts with, and especially its companies, is getting secure access to the resources, especially the commodities, and foodstuffs that they need um, for the Chinese economy and to feed the 1.4 billion Chinese people. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, look for secure access to the markets, especially uh, markets in uh, advanced technologies and other things that have high value added components as part of a diverse modern economy. And certainly uh, China looks uh, to secure its uh, security um, and its uh, political place in the world as well and to deal with some of the consequences that it believes uh, may come from the actions that it, it seeks to secure it, it, its own uh, uh, objectives. How does China's activities in Latin America compare to that in other parts of the world? That's a great question. In general, China's activities in Latin America are comparable to uh, other parts of the world. And that makes sense when you consider that it's the same uh, Chinese foreign ministry, the same uh, Chinese cultural traditions and perspectives, and oftentimes it's the same Chinese state-oriented enterprises, uh, state-owned enterprises uh, based in Beijing or Shanghai or, or, or other places. Now, you do see uh, variations, uh, but for me, uh, looking at uh, China in Africa versus Latin America, or China in Eastern Europe versus Latin America, um, what you find is the differences sometimes have more to do with the historical relationship or the nature of, of the company, whether there are uh, commodities that to be had or whether there are highly uh, institutionalized governments or, or more uh, populistic governments. But it really has less to do with the region than the characteristics of the individual partners that they're engaging with. How are PRN or China activities in Latin America impacting the region? Well, really, there are a variety of, of different ways. Um, and sometimes it, it's subtle. So first of all, there are economic impacts on the region. So China is very good through it, its loans and through its business engagement in, um, in uh, securing relationships. But oftentimes those relationships in terms of extracting commodities or, or in terms of, uh, of securing a dominant position uh, 
in manufacturing or, or other areas uh, has the uh, indirect effect of uh, competing with and sometimes undermining the value-added production in, in the region itself. And so on the one hand, you have uh, detrimental economic effects, but at the same time, it also impacts the characteristics of, of Latin American democracies because China is very good at providing loans without saying, okay, we want you to be democratic, we want you to be transparent, as oftentimes the, the United States does. And so by providing that uh, essentially open checkbook, it undermines the message that we in the United States have long tried to secure with respect to human rights, with respect to democracy, and the promotion of um, a, a market-oriented uh, economy. And so in many ways, it, it's changing the trajectory of the region in ways that, uh, for at least for us in the United States, does not make us entirely comfortable. Tell me some more about loans, these loans. Absolutely. And there are a lot of misunderstanding about uh, loans. Uh, so in general, uh, some of the highest profile loans that you have uh, that are talked about are the big Chinese, what they call policy banks, such as uh, China Development Bank or China Exim Bank. And, uh, China became relatively well known in Latin America when uh, those two big banks especially began loaning a lot of money to um, uh, a different, especially populist governments. So uh, in the case of Venezuela, for example, uh, CDB, China Development Bank, and, and China Exim Bank provided uh, about uh, $64 billion to Venezuela. Um, in Ecuador, at the time when Ecuador was uh, headed by a, a populist leader, Rafael Correa, uh, from about 2006, um, again, there are a lot of loans that went into major Ecuadorian projects, uh, about uh, $13 billion there. Um, so in both of those cases, the, the net effect was to allow those leaders to pursue the economic policies that they wanted moving against the private sector, the political uh, policies that they wanted in, in consolidating power. Um, but many people thought that because China was loaning money to uh, leaders that had moved against the private sector, that had been bad credit risks to institutions like the International Monetary Fund, that the Chinese were being foolish. Um, in reality, however, um, although the Chinese do do uh, commercial loans with many countries in the region, uh, more reliable creditors like um, you know, borrowers like, like Chile or, or Colombia, when China has dealt with uh, countries like uh, Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and, and Nicolas Maduro, it's very good at making sure that it, it gets paid. And so in the case How of Venezuela... How does it get paid? Yeah. Great question. Um, and in the case of Venezuela and in Ecuador, um, it securitizes its loans through commodities. So I'll give you an example in the case of Venezuela. Um, when it first structured the deals in about 2008, uh, it created something called the Heavy Investment Fund. Now, the way that worked is that on the one hand, um, you had Chinese companies that were operating in Venezuela's petroleum sector. Now, Venezuela has about 300 billion barrels of recoverable oil, and so um, it's very attractive to petroleum companies. But um, uh, China National Petroleum Corporation, in partnership with Venezuela's uh, uh, petroleum company, Petavesa, were pumping out the oil. As they pumped out the oil under contract, so with a certain volume, uh, they received a, a certain price for that oil, which was you know, market uh, price uh, plus a little bit of a markup. Um, but uh, as they received that oil, it was credited to an account in a bank in China. Now, in parallel to that, uh, you also had Chinese companies that were on a line of credit doing work. And so, for example, you'd have companies like China Harbor or um, uh, China State Construction Enterprises who were building roads and thermoelectric plants and, and dams and, and things like that. And so if you think about it as having like a credit card, and so um, as those companies did work, it, it ran up the, the credit against that, that $4 billion. Um, and as Chinese oil companies then um, took delivery on the oil, it basically paid off those credits in, in an agreed to uh, amount. Um, but the magic of that was that in a sense, the money never actually left China. The work got done by the Chinese companies, and it would have been really difficult for uh, Venezuela to default on its loans, because the only way for it to default would have been for it to physically intervene to stop the Chinese oil companies from pumping the oil that was being used to repay the loans. It, it wasn't like, for example, in Ecuador when the, the previous a populist uh, leader there, Rafael Correa, said, okay, um, you know, the IMF loans are illegitimate, we're not going to repay the loans, and just didn't and send the, the, the check. And so China is very good at structuring deals across the board to make sure that they get paid, and that's something that's not commonly realized. How much influence does China, does China have in Latin America? And how significant is its presence in the, well, let's, go, let's take that first one. 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, uh, China's influence is often misunderstood. This is a question I get all the time. So when we think of, of U.S. influence, uh, for example, we talk a lot about soft power. We think about uh, people who have studied in, in U.S. universities and then go back with their concept of uh, what is good about U.S. democracy or what is good about free market economics, and they voluntarily apply those ideas in, in their own countries. Um, or they just simply like U.S. culture or like the United States, and so they tend to adopt relatively open uh, policy policies toward the United States. In the case of China, there is a certain amount of that. There are people who are great admirers of the, you know, the, the, the deep and complex and, and long Chinese history and, and, and the, the very strong Chinese culture. Um, however, uh, a bigger component in the Chinese case is what I like to call expectation of benefit. And so um, there's two dimensions. One is the idea that if you want access to the Chinese market, or on the other hand, if you want to be the partner for a local business deal, or if you are you know, the leader who's signing the contract and, and you know that uh, you know, your brother-in-law's sister's company will get the intermediation contract for, for that deal. Um, there's that expectation that you don't want to say anything or do anything that's going to undermine that. And, and so what ends up happening is that um, certain things that the Chinese do, which, which are well known, for example, um, in uh, interning almost two million Uyghur Muslims in, in Xinjiang in, in, in internment camps, or for example, in violating their commitment on Hong Kong and, and suppressing democracy in Hong Kong, or you know, frankly, in the internet and other controls that they put over their own people. Um, those are things that uh, people in Latin America with the hopes of just doing the business with the Chinese know that if they talk too much about, well, maybe that could put uh, their, their business at risk. And so, for example, I, I joke around that uh, people in Latin America don't worry that if they talk too harshly about the Biden administration or, or the Trump administration, that suddenly uh, ExxonMobil is not going to invest in their country. But it's a bit different with China. So um, a big part of the... And a bit different because so many of the, of the uh, things that are supplied by China to those countries are controlled by state corporations. Exactly. So you have the um, the national level state-owned enterprises. You also have uh, different other types. Uh, for example, at the um, you know, the provincial local level, you know, state-owned enterprises. But even uh, things that are considered private enterprises, uh, because they have communist party structures or other regulatory mechanisms by which uh, they can be tightly controlled by the Chinese, are in one way or another um, accessible to the Chinese. And so there's a lot of messaging that goes on about uh, what is or is not permissible if you want to stay in good graces with the, with the Chinese leadership. Um, but the Chinese are also notably much more vindictive, I would say. And oftentimes it's not uh, a, an overt thing. So, for example, uh, many of the, uh, the listeners may remember when, uh, for example, in Australia, com country far outside of Latin America, uh, there was a lot of questioning about the uh, origins of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in, in Wuhan, China. Um, however, uh, in raising those concerns, China turned around and put uh, sharp uh, export controls on Argentine exports of, of, of beef and other agricultural products and, and even Argentine uh, minerals, uh, severely hurting the Argentine economy. And it was, I'm sorry, the, um, the, the Australian economy. And it was, it was understood that, uh, you know, if you speak too critically about China, there may be these uh, retributions. And so um, th that concern not to upset China, um, and, and that filters in other ways too. And so uh, there are, uh, China's very good at something that they call people-to-people -people diplomacy. And so, uh, for example, uh, uh, some of La uh, Latin America's leading scholars, they will bring to Confucius Institutes to learn Mandarin Chinese. And then later, uh, there are cultural promotion organizations. Uh, th the main one is called Hanban, uh, where, uh, uh, Again, they will bring some of Latin America's leading scholars to places like Fudan University and, and train them, or, or even uh, some specialists. They, they will bring um, uh, Congress people and journalists and, and others. And all of those people know, you know, they may not be compromised by, by the Chinese, but they understand that uh, they have relationships and they wouldn't want to seem ungrateful by speaking out too critically against the Chinese. And so there's, there's a, a subtle web of, of influence. Um, and again, it, it doesn't turn people into propagandists, but it impacts the debate in ways in which the people who are most knowledgeable about the risks and nature of uh, China in Latin America and, and elsewhere are oftentimes reluctant to, uh, to speak out. And, and even in the United States, uh, we can remember not too long ago when even the, um, the, the, the National Basketball Association with a lot of money in terms of, of the Chinese market uh, was 
was um, very concerned about saying things, uh, you know, critical of, of the Chinese because of their concern of, of losing that access to, to, to the Chinese market. And, and the Chinese actually uh, cut out the, the NBA for, for a while fr from the Chinese market. And so it's that, um, you know, dancing on one's tippy toes uh, in order to not say things that are too critical. And in the process, it distorts the debate, not only here in the United States, but especially in Latin America that you, that you have about China. And, and that exercises a lot of influence. It really concerns me very, very much when I see uh, some of the major corporations having uh, branches and mm. uh, doing manufacturing mm. in China and mm. uh, even having, perhaps having their mm. patents uh, taken over by the Chinese in, through the Chinese courts. Well, and you raise a very good point. Um, and it, it's systematic and, it, and it's global in nature. I mean, this has long been a concern for, for the United States. Um, the way in which, uh, not only for the United States, but Europe and in Latin America and elsewhere, um, the Chinese have been notoriously um, non-respectful of, of intellectual property and, and have seen uh, technologies and things that they want as, as uh, you know, things that they pursue seek to acquire in one way or another. And so, for example, it's been long known that in China itself uh, that um, you know, if you wanted to get an investment that gave you access to the Chinese market, you had to partner with a, a local Chinese company. I, I remember, for example, talking with executives from one of Brazil's biggest uh, technology aviation companies, Embraer, um, and they understood when they went into the, the, the Chinese market. I, at the time, um, they were doing a co-production of their regional business jet, the, um, the ERJ-145, as, as I remember. Um, and they understood that the Chinese were going to try to rob their intellectual property and then beat them into the market with, the, um, with, with a large jet offering of, of their own and cut Embraer out. And so the bet for Embraer was that they could protect their intellectual property that the Chinese were trying to rob um, and force themselves into the large market before the Chinese could steal their property. And so it's always that, 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 that tussle. But what often happens, and it's happened in place after place, uh, so, so many of the, um, for example, photovoltaics, Voltaic panels and solar energy, um, wind farm technology, um, uh, the accusation that those patents have been stolen, um, and then of course mass produced to give uh, Chinese companies an, an, an advantage. But what happens in, in Latin America, which becomes even, even more concerning, is that when you go to China, you understand that your IP, your intellectual property, is at risk. But when you operate in Latin America, what you don't realize is there are many ways in which even there, your, your intellectual property is now increasingly at risk from Chinese companies. So for example, um, the Chinese have dominated the, uh, the market in, in telephones and telecommunications, mm -hmm. Huawei and ZTE, since really the late 1990s. She, please talk about the 5G, their, their version of the 5G network. Absolutely. So, so for me, 5G is only the latest and, and biggest example of a broader problem in, in terms of, of the ability to uh, essentially um, you know, protect information, information uh, concerning uh, the decisions and, and pr uh, you know, private lives of, of leaders, of governments, uh, of military secrets, but also of commercial secrets. And so um, I would cast it far broader than, than 5G, but, but happy to. So, um, uh, Huawei started in the late 1990s uh, with mm -hmm. many different offerings in terms of the connectivity, in terms of other telephones, in terms of the ZTE. And so it's estimated right now that about 60% of the entire telecommunication backbone in Latin America is, um, is, is, is Chinese, Huawei and ZTE. Uh, and then on top of that, you have uh, not only the Huawei and ZTE phones, but other Chinese uh, operators and, and, and uh, producers of, of smartphones like, like Oppo or Xiaomi, which is considered the, the, the Chinese Apple. But it goes even far beyond that because on top of the telecommunications infrastructure, Huawei is very big in cloud computing right now. And so um, Huawei has about nine different cloud computing centers in, in Latin America. On top of that, um, they have, for example, a, a series of different uh, digital surveillance and, and technology companies that, that use biometrics uh, and, and uh, do um, you know, remote processing. So companies like Hikvision or, or Dahua on top of, of Huawei uh, implementing these vast smart cities and safe cities solution. Or you have um, in, in areas like business to business, uh, companies like, like Alibaba. So the bottom line is, you know, 
5G is, is important because it's something that where, where Huawei is, you know, it has an advantage. Um, and just the amount of data that you collect on, and, and the things that you use for the Internet of Things that is empowered by, by 5G, um, the opportunities that it gives you uh, for somebody who can offload that information and, and analyze it. So, you know, if the Chinese own the technology, their ability to, to get that is, is impressive. But, but it's not just 5G. It's 5G. It's other telecommunications. It's cloud computing. It's data surveillance systems. It's, um, it's even taxi ride sharing. There's, um, for those of us who are familiar with, with Uber, there's a, a Chinese competitor that's even bigger than Uber in, in Latin America called Didi Chuxun. Um, and if you think about the amount of, of data that government personnel or business personnel would have, uh, if, if you, know, um, you know where everyone's going and who's meeting with who, um, you, know, you have not only opportunities for information that is you know, blackmail, you have information about who and, and where important government business meetings are taking place with your competitors, et cetera. So at the bottom line, China's increasing presence in what I would call the entire digital space makes it very hard for our Latin American counterparts to protect government information, to protect the information about their leaders, including you know, blackmailable personal characteristics, or frankly, to even protect personal information. And, and, I, and, I, go, and I go back to that, that corporate analogy, the, the Embraer. Um, so um, many companies that wouldn't think of locating their core intellectual property in China don't fully realize how the ubiquity of Chinese digital technologies puts their IP at risk everywhere that Chinese digital uh, companies operate. And are the, is, are the Chi uh, is this Chinese digital technology compatible with that produced in the United States? Or is it something else? Well, and that's a, very, that's a very good question. And there's a couple, uh, there's a couple issues. Uh, we'll talk about standards in, in just a minute. Um, but while there is a technological compatibility, um, one of the risks is uh, that um, the, the way in which uh, Chinese architectures are you know, potentially set up, the vulnerability of, of things like, like backdoors. And so if information uh, goes to a server in China, uh, you know, the question is, are there opportunities to, to grab that data by, by par parties that you wouldn't even think? And the interesting thing is that the 2017 Chinese national security law says that all Chinese companies are obliged, not just asked, you know, but obliged to turn over data that's of use for, for the government for, for national security reasons if the government makes that determination. So if you think about it, we have fights in the United States, uh, you know, individuals, um, you know, knowing before they, they yield personal data on things like Facebook. Um, in China, it's, it's completely the opposite. And so part of the risk is that what in China people have, have given up uh, in order to have a technological you know, efficiency and in, in, in things like that, um, is those technologies and ar those architectures become increasingly ubiquitous. The ability to um, you know, protect secrets uh, decreases, but also just the ability to have any other alternative uh, gets harder and harder. So. Obviously, in the, uni the United States, we've restricted companies like, like uh, Huawei and ZTE, but also um, popular apps like, like TikTok, for, for example. But the other issue then is standards. So, um, for example, right now in, in 5G, part of the problem is that Huawei has gotten so advanced um, with its, its offering and architecture that it's hard for Nokia or Ericsson or, or others to compete. The question then is um, that um, you know, if Huawei, because it becomes the dominant technology, or other Chinese companies, if they define the standards, um, not only does, do those new standards put personal privacy at risk for, for everyone, but if Huawei locks in their advantage with, with the standards, um, think, think back to the days when uh, you know, Bill Gates and, and the designing of the, the Microsoft op operating system to, you know, so that everything would be Word and Excel and, and things like that. It's the exact same risk. And, and so um, there are strategic battles going on right now, for example, um, in trying the United States and Europe and, and others working together to basically prevent the Chinese from dominating the standard space. Because dominating the standard space, apart from the technology, allows them to essentially become the only game in town. And then when you want to say, Big well, brother. I exactly. How significant is, well, you've answered how significant the PRC presence is in the digital sectors in Latin America, and what concerns this raises. How do uh, Chinese Confucius Institutes and people-to-people -people diplomacy play a role in Chinese activities in Latin America? 
That's a great question. Um, and, and again, it's one of those things that's often misunderstood. So you probably heard a lot about, peop- uh, about Confucius Institutes uh, in the United States and, and concerns that they are centers of propaganda or, or espionage. And again, in, in the 20 years I followed this, I think there's some of that. In Latin America, there's about 44 Confucius Institutes. And um, what I tend to see most importantly is the Confucius Institutes are, are fundamentally gatekeepers. And so if you are a young person interested in Mandarin Chinese or the Chinese character set or, or culture, um, it, it's a way to get some free entry-level Chinese education. Now, if you are um, you know, a much better student than I am and have the ability to, to stick it out with that very difficult you know, Mandarin and, and, and the Chinese language, um, if you are one of the maybe two or three percent that really has that, that discipline, um, you then become eligible for scholarships to study in a place like Fudan University, et cetera, or, or, or Baida, or Tsinghua, or, or others. Now, in Latin America, there are very, very few people who have that amount of, of linguistic mm-hmm. and other technical knowledge about China. And so at the end of the day, who in Latin America is hired by their governments to work in their ministries of commerce, their, their ministry of foreign affairs, the people with Chinese language expertise. Where do a significant portion of those people get that expertise, but having studied in China at the largesse of the Chinese government? So, the, um, so really what Confucius Institutes do is they become a, a, a way, um, not necessarily compromising, but fundamentally shaping the outcome of the key people in Latin America who are their government's China-facing elites. But as you also pointed out, it goes for, for broadly than Confucius Institutes. Now, I worked 14 years in the private sector, uh, including China you know, studies before I, I got involved in government. And so I, I've seen this in person. I, I used to teach in Beijing. I, I, I know how it works. Um, and I don't think I can think of anyone who is a reputable China scholar in, in Latin America who hasn't been at least once, if not several times, to these, the, these various uh, different uh, China trips. Sometimes they're group trips like the China Latin America Think Tank Forum. Sometimes they are individual trips where an unnamed think tank will come up with some money to you know, buy you a first class plane ticket and, and take you over and you'll get to meet colleagues from China Academy of Social Sciences or, or the party or, or key businesses. But also, too, don't the top leaders and also these people get news feeds, free news feeds from, uh, from China? It, well, exactly. And that's, that's an additional part of the, the, the difficulty. So just looking at the, at the media, you have, for example, CGTN yet provides visual news feeds and audio news feeds. Um, I mean, think about just the, those horrible pictures that we used to see of, for example, President Trump. I mean, you, um, you know, a free media chooses what it wants to show, whether it's chaos or otherwise. In China, you see good pictures of Xi Jinping, and it's what you don't see more than anything. But it's also the, the journalists that are invited over to, to, to Latin America from, um, to, to China from Latin America. Um, it is the, the free advertising supplements. Uh, so newspapers like La Tercera in, in Chile um, sometimes will get substantial amounts of, of advertising purchases from, fr- from the Chinese. And again, they know that if they are too critical, that could put that advertising revenue, which becomes really important, at, at risk. Thank you so much, uh, Evan. You've been very, very, very informational. Until the next time, I am Sandra Shovey. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.